Good morning, and thank you all for coming together for this roundtable discussion panel. And thank you, Winona, uh, for the incredible, energizing, insightful talk that you gave us last night. We are joined now by three more amazing panelists to continue the conversation, Shanai Madsen, Chinupa Hanska luger and Steve Hilton. To start off the session, I've asked Shanai, Chinupa, and Steve to offer a brief self-introduction and a response to the keynote address. Then to transition into a more open exchange, I'll have a question for Winona. And I have a few more questions for the panel that I'll sprinkle in as we go. Uh, and as we get towards the end of our time period, I hope we'll be able to open the floor for some questions from the audience. Uh, my name is Shania Matson, and um, I'm an artist, a cultural organizer, one of the co-directors of an organization called Water Bar and Public Studio. Um, we serve water, literally. Uh, we have a water bar where we give away different drinking waters as a way to talk about where water comes from um, and all the issues uh, that touch that. So um, that's one thing that I'll be bringing to the discussion today. Uh, Hideo also asked me, and I really appreciated that he had this question, which was, um, I live here in Minneapolis, and um, to give a little context to where we are, um, and those of you who are visiting, especially um, to remember that we are here on Dakota homeland, um, Mani, do you guys know this word, Mani? Anyone? We're going to probably be talking about this <laughs> a little bit. Uh, Minnesota, that's a Dakota word. Um, and that, uh, so we all speak a little bit of Dakota here. Um, and that's not just an acknowledgement, like to make a checkbox here. We did a land acknowledgement. This is Dakota homeland. But also because uh, those kinds of things, the language we use to describe where we are, the stories we tell or don't tell, um, who belongs and the ways of those people are all important parts of the work that I do as an artist and an organizer and also a big part of the discussion that we had last night uh, with Winona. Uh, I actually come from northern Minnesota. I'm also a Northland person. I grew up on the Mississippi River in a little town called Palisade, uh, which is very close to where Enbridge uh, is planning to put, would like to put line three. Um, and my family and some of my friends there are part of the resistance to that pipeline. Um, and so we can talk a little bit about what that looks like um, in the community that I come from, um, which is mostly folks uh, in my immediate area and my family come to this land from Europe and have been part of uh, what has changed this ecology. So my grandfather uh, was involved in mining, was involved in clearing uh, white pine. Um, so, so another thing that I think about in the artwork that I create um, is how to repair some of those relationships, uh, both my own relationships with land and water, but then also how to be a force for helping other people in my community um, come around to a better way of living with land. And a lot of that is listening to and learning from our indigenous uh, neighbors and friends. Um, so I, I can talk uh, a little bit about how this idea of regenerative economies figures into my work as a socially engaged artist, um, some projects I'm working on coming up. Um, and also would just really like to continue the inspiring conversations and challenges that Winona brought to, to us last night. So thank you all. I'm really happy to be here. Dosha Maragua, Dishkagna Hudosha, Nitawe Hudosha, Chinupa Hanska Luger, Nueta, Hiratsa Arikara, Lakota, Germanic, Scandinavian. Oh, and Awache. Hello, my friends. Who are you and why have you come? My name is Chinupa Hanska Luger and I am Mandan Hidatsa Arikara, also Lakota and Germanic and Scandinavian descent. Um, I am everything that made it into North Dakota, uh, uh, all mixed up. Um, uh, I wanted to thank you all for inviting me here to have this discussion and um, my practice has a, a background in ceramics uh, but I do a lot of mixed media work and of late have been really kind of driving my practice more into a uh, social engineering context. Um, with that being said, I'm really interested in, in figuring out what, what this conversation looks like as we talk with you rather than at you. So thank you. My name is Steve Hilton and I've spent a lot of time thinking about um, what I would say here and how I would introduce myself. And, and I decided to give a sense of who I am by telling you a little bit about where I come from. And, and so I'd like to start, and the differences and the similarities between us as panelists are, are 
are interesting, I think. And my dad's ethnicity was English, and he was an Air Force officer. And, and so instead of a sense of place, which I think you guys have, um, I don't really have a sense of place. I have lived all over the, the country, 15 different states. I lived in Europe for seven years. And, and um, in, that, in that time, my dad taught me several really important lessons. And, and that's part of the reason why I do the work that I do. Um, one of the most important things he taught me was, um, was uh, be kind, be polite, um, be kind to everybody, and inadvertently um, make friends fast because we're going to move soon. Um, so my mom was a surgical nurse, and she was born in the Choctaw Nation in Oklahoma, but her, grand, her father was not um, going to have that with his family. So he, as soon as she was born, they moved to California like most Okies did. And uh, most of it was to get away from that association with a, a native culture. And, and over the years, I think, um, as, I, as I've thought about this a lot, I think this is what has, um, has pushed me to be um, most empathetic to, to people that are, are marginalized. And so then I, I'd like to fast forward, and I'm a little embarrassed to say what I'm about to say, fast forward to s why I'm here and how I, how I made it here. Um, my first job out of high school was working on pipeline. And I did that to make my way through college. And I um, worked on the pipeline every, every moment that I could because it was one way I could make a lot of money really fast. Um, I, I eventually grew up and, and I eventually uh, earned a degree in environmental geology. And, uh, and then I think I really um, started um, well, having fun, and, and I, I taught on a 140-foot sailboat for a couple of years. I taught kids um, who had a choice of going to prison or coming with us, um, and uh, um, I moved to St. Louis. I, I taught high school environmental science. I started an environmental science program at the high school where I taught and, and taught astronomy, oceanography. Um, I did that for 10 years, and then my wife and I decided to be have more fun. We moved to uh, um, to Utah and taught snowboarding for a couple of years. Um, somehow, all this led me to where I am here, um, and and to my position at Midwestern State University, where I am a professor of art and art education. I've been there for 13 years. Um, so, secondly, I, I decided I should talk for a second just about the things that I try to teach my students, and and what I want to get across to the people that work with me in my installations. I do larger scale installations and they're collaborative where I'm the facilitator and, and the artists are the people that I'm working with. And um, n the number one thing that I try to teach my students and, and my collaborators is do something. Do something, don't just complain about the world around you because that doesn't um, help any of us. Um, and number two, and it's something Winona said last night, take control of your destiny. And do this by saying yes more than you say no. And I'm sitting here because Josh Green asked me, and, and, and I had to live by my mantra, say yes more than you say no. Um, so thank you, Josh. Um, so I also realized five years and about 10 months ago that, um, that I couldn't be um, pessimistic anymore. And I tried to be more proactive in the way that I said yes. Um, five years ago, I had my son, and, and I realized that, that, the, that I had to be optimistic about the world. I couldn't think the way that I was thinking. I couldn't, to the point where I, I'm not very friendly on Facebook because if, if you're talking uh, about how bad the world is, I just, I kind of unfriend you. Um, and, and that's, it, it's got to the point where I even unfriended my sister. Um, so a few things that, um, that I've done at, while at Wichita Falls or while at Midwestern, in 2010, I heard that one in four children in the city of Wichita Falls were, were hungry, were food insecure. And so we started a, um, a, a, uh, an Empty Bowls event. And the Empty Bowls event, um, we've been doing that for seven years. I make, we make 1,000 bowls a year, and we average about $80,000 a year. And that adds up to about $560,000, which is equal to about 1.7 million meals. Um, eight months ago, I heard that one in five students at Midwestern were hungry. And so I was talking to some continuing ed students so, that I have, and some of them are, are somewhat wealthy. 
And a few days later, one of them writes a check for $100,000 to, um, to go into a food scholarship. And, and that, that food scholarship money has been increasing exponentially. It's really pretty amazing. Um, so our students get swiped on their card. They don't have to go hungry anymore. Um, when it comes to politics, I, I've been tired of the rhetoric and the vitriol, and my finger's getting tired, I have to switch, um, it's long before 2016. And, and during the election of 2016, it became somewhat unbearable to the point where I, I really, I had to do something because I couldn't just listen to what people were saying anymore. And so I started registering people to vote. And I live on campus. Almost all the students in my particular dorm are registered to vote now. Um, while I'm talking about politics, the shameless plug, my, one of my students, Bailey Pitzer, is running for uh, um, student director at large. Um, and this is something that I try to teach my students. Um, be active. Go do something for your community. And, and like um, Shania's work, the, the water bar, um, she's, she's pushing the world, she's changing the world a little bit at a time. Like Chinupa's work, um, the, uh, the missing and murdered indigenous women, girls, queer and trans people, bead project, everyone, and the mirror shield, shield project, they're changing the world. Winona is changing the world. She's making a difference in, in, in their cases, I think, much in a much bigger sense than I am. But I'd like to encourage you, no, really implore you, to do something. Stop complaining. Um, stop complaining about how or horrible the orange guy is. Um, do something to help your community. As Winona said last night, don't have historical and ecolog ecological amnesia. Um, change is made by the hands of individuals. Take control of your destiny. And please become a community sculptor. That means uh, good morning. How y'all doing, good? I'm happy to see everybody. I really enjoyed my, my time so far here, and uh, I'm looking forward to the day and looking forward to this panel. Y'all heard pretty much what I had to say last night. I did, I did want to say I'm actually not opposed to pipes. I like water and sewer. I think they're fabulous. You know what I'm saying? It's what's in the pipe is my problem, right? And why, and why it's there. And um, I, I want to see infrastructure for people, not for corporations. You know, and we have a D in infrastructure in this country, so I'm all about pipes. I just want good ones. Um, and uh, besides that, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm really, um, I'm happy to be here. And uh, I know Shania a long time um, and in her little village of Palisade. They're like a little, little tough village. They fought off a bunch of projects. <laughs> Bad ideas. Bad ideas. Like, I call it that. I just, just like a little pitch on this. So she lived in a little village. It's like almost pretty much all, all like re re relatives of hers from what I can figure, right? <laughs> <laughs> right, you know, so I didn't know Palisade because why would I go see this little village? But the pipeline projects bring us all together, you know, because there's all these people that never met each other and they're bound by this really bad idea, right? And so I, I go to her little village and I just want to say, so then I start listening to the stories. So the, the first project I think was the, uh, was it at the Minnesota Experimental City? Yeah, they wanted to put an, a whole new city of 250,000 on, on a swamp. It's pretty wet there. Uh, they didn't think about where they were going to... Under a dome. Under a dome, yeah. It was going to be environmentally sustainable, like little bubble city. Didn't ask, didn't ask anybody, but I was like, wow. Got some money from the state legislator, put a city in the middle of a swamp. I was like, good, 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 good idea. Then the next idea, I think, was the uh, nuclear waste dump proposal. Yeah, they wanted to put a garbage incinerator right on the banks of the Mississippi. No, that was the, no, oh, that that was the nuclear we, waste. That was little, oh, yeah, the MRS. That's right. Proposal, I nuclear waste, waste proposal <laughs> that was up there a little bit. And then they want to put a garbage dump and then a pipeline. And I just want to say that that plucky bunch of people from Palisade fought off every one of those projects, huh? <laughs> and this one, this one is not going to happen either, I think. Yeah, I think no, right every one of them. You guys shoved it out of your town already. Yeah. yeah. So I was just going to say, like, she's an example of changes happened by the, you know, hands of individuals. And uh, I'm happy to be here with everybody. So thanks. Building on uh, some of the comments that were just made, I was really struck at the end of Winona's talk last night by this story that she shared about the little clay balls with the seeds in them and kind of how that related to the idea of community seed keeping as distinguished from some entity somewhere in the world trying to keep seeds on behalf of all humanity, right? And so as several of you have just repeated, just in the same way, that change is in our individual hands. Continuity is also in our individual hands or preserving history. 
So uh, from, where I, from, from where I sit, I immediately then uh, turn to thinking of teaching and learning as sort of seeds, right? things that we pass down. And so the question that came up that I, I was hoping you guys could maybe address is, what are we not teaching and learning um, that we really should be teaching and learning with our students in this spirit of trying to keep alive traditions and lessons from the past that are gonna, that are gonna help us have a better future? We're talking to a particular you know, bubble of, of makers and, and creators and, and stuff along those lines. But from my travels and engaging with uh, uh, many different cultures and also just communities and, and students and school bodies and stuff like that. Um, I also, I have two little boys, so I'm hyper aware of, of like this need to be optimistic in, 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 in the world. Um, and I have a lot of uh, uh, faith in this next generation as far as their ability to communicate to one another. But I don't want to put all the pressure of change on their shoulders. Um, but with that being said, one thing that I think that's really important is I think we're really good and have a lot of really great theories out there. Um, and we talk a lot about, you know, these, we talk, we talk a lot <laughs> about things. Um, and, and I charge everybody with the responsibility of shifting theory into practice. Um, and doing that every day in, in, your, in, in whatever it is you're, you're attempting. Take some of those ideas that you've been working towards, um, some of the ideas that perhaps your mentors have instructed you on, um, or, or your elders, or however, however your culture's developed. Like, try to apply some of that, of that knowledge into your daily life, um, because I think that's, I think that's a, a, a dramatic shift um, that needs to happen is, is we've, we've communicated with one another. We told each other what we need. Um, and now it's a question of doing it, you know, and, and actually participating and practicing what that theory is. One of the really simple but profound, but very profound kind of lessons that I think we try to weave into the work that we're doing at Water Bar, that I try to, to impart on students when I'm working in, in classroom settings and then also with my own children is just to reconnect those relationships. So to really think about the fact that all water, for example, comes from somewhere. I mean, how many of us turn on our tap and really have no idea where that water comes from? Um, and that's a really simple thing that we can do. And it isn't, you know, once we start to do that, we start to see it everywhere. So with my children, for example, um, we like to say hello to the river and thank you to the river everywhere that we see it, which means also when they take a bath, we say see you later. Or when we're washing dishes or when we're walking and we're looking at water collecting in the street that's going down the storm drains. And now that they can start to see those relationships and that those things are connected for them, they ask better questions. You know, they say, how are you, River? Why do you look that way? What's, where did all that stuff come from? And my son actually at one point was like, he actually met some water protectors. We got to go see um, some folks who were protesting um, against the Enbridge pipeline and he wanted to know, you know, why, are, why do people want to do this? That doesn't seem like a good idea. Like I've seen that that water goes from the street down into the river, like why would we put oil there, that's bad, right? You know, and I think some of those things we have to really start with the really basic, like reconnecting, remembering, um, because as long as we have that amnesia, it's going to be a lot easier to pull fast ones on us and tell us that you know the jobs are worth it. You know, and no, you know, you said you mentioned that you know working on the pipeline was a way to get jobs, and that's an appeal that a lot of people in the community that I come from it works on them because they need jobs. Um, but until we help people connect the dots, we can't say that there are better jobs. And one of the things I just think about a lot is that, is that we, uh, we don't teach people how to do stuff, but you all do. You know, by and large, we teach people, I can't even say we th teach critical thinking in some of these universities, but I feel like you get out of school and, and you can't cook, you can't farm, you can't fix stuff, you can't, you know what I'm saying? This is like, it requires us all to buy stuff right, or to have someone do it. And I think that, you know, so I'm, I'm really a proponent of kind of that, that, you know, I, I mean, it's like the renaissance, the enlightened renaissance, like being able to take care of things. And, uh, and but you know, you, uh, you are in ceramics, and so you are teaching people to do things. But I mean, I'm sure that you understand kind of my argument is, is that it's not helpful to have a bunch of people who just think and talk. 
it's, it's, it, we need to be people who do things. So. I think that not just, well, one, ceramics we have to be able to fix and, think, and right. make things. Right. I mean, because if, like really <laughs> cool. if we didn't, we would be in big trouble. Um, so I, I try to work with my students and, again, my collaborators. Um, one of the most important things that, that I don't think we're taught, I know, well, I wasn't taught well enough, and, and that is to listen, to actively listen to what our, our friends and even sometimes the people that we don't agree with. We don't listen to what they say. We don't really listen to, to their comments. We're ready to just um, either A, agree with them and, and continue on with their argument or their thought, or B, completely shut them down and, and not listen to who they are and why they think the way they think. And so I, as, a, as a professor, as a, an artist, one of the things that I try to do is get people to actively listen, not listen passively. There was a moment that flashed by really quickly, uh, but you had up on the screen a big map, and you said something about when Enbridge was thinking about how to run pipelines, there was some way they couldn't go, so they just pulled up a map and thought, oh, we can just go down this way and cut through the corner of a reservation. And it struck me in that moment that, wow, you know, a map or that standard kind of map that we look at, it's a very brutal sort of abstraction for land and place, right? It really, it's this kind of view from up on high. It's really just about getting from point A to point B in, in the fastest possible way, but it doesn't kind of have time in it or anybody's stories or anybody's histories. It doesn't show kind of the ways that people are, how they, you know, ways of being on the land. So I was just wondering if any of you had had any thoughts or experiences to share about, you know, are there different ways that we can understand maps and geography? Uh, by which I mean, um, you know, is what's wrong with the kinds of maps that we use and the way that we read maps? You know, we look at those maps and we don't see the people that are there. We don't see the land that's there. And so uh, you know, that's a part and parcel of this whole theme of abstraction and you know just now in the conversation I was also really struck by this difference between theories you know which makes me think of something really kind of abstract kind of knowledge versus stories which are a very uh, personal and embodied kind of knowledge. Um, I just want to say something on this which is like I think that Americans have really bad geography generally you know I mean I, I was kind of like saying that note about the Midwest last night you know because it doesn't make any sense to me like what is that right? And then you got a whole continent named after white guys. I mean, you know, like with no, like, so for instance, you know, the place where life begins. That's what the Gwich'in people call the coastal plain of what's known as the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge. They call it the place where life begins because 150,000 caribou calf their young there. That's a lot different than section 2002, right? Or, you know, you got a mountain up there by north of Duluth called, um, it's, we know it as the, as the place where the Thunderbirds land, the Thunderbirds rest, you know, that's in the Ojibwe teachings that the Thunderbirds land there, and they call that Mount McKay, which is kind of, a, you know, the story of America naming large mountains after small men. <laughs> you know, and I don't, you know, and I really don't have anything, you know, I mean, I love, I love men, but it's just like the whole idea of, like, how do y'all get so arrogant that something that lasts 60 years gets a mountain named after it when it had, a, you know, had its own life before, right? You know, and so there's a lot of, but you see, you're seeing this renaming and reclaiming, like, you know, now called Haida Gwaii, but it was called the Queen Charlotte Islands. Like, who was Queen Charlotte, by the way? You know, that one, I missed that one in my British history. You know, but, like, how does she get an island? It's, it's off of the, what they call British Columbia. I mean, you, you understand what I'm saying? It's like this colonial naming and claiming thing, you know, which totally misses the beauty of place and the fact that that's where the spring is, that the water comes from. You know, if you just name it, you know, there's no sense of, sense of location on that. And so, I, you know, I think, I mean, you, you all dig clay from land. So you have some sense of place and of understanding of how, you know, Mother Earth is and where things are and how you learn from that relationship of where your clay is to where this water is or, you know. So I know I just my general observation is the bad geography that it's our opportunity. So now they call that Haida Gwaii where Queen Charlotte's Islands and Haida Gwaii is um, because the Haidas lived there for like 10,000 years. Or Mount McKinley is now Mount Denali, right? That place, Ayers Rock, remember that place from Scooby-Doo, whatever, over there in <laughs> Australia? Well, who was Ayers, right? You know, I mean, so now it's called Uluru, which is what was called before. 
So I'm always happy when I see that renaming of places to like what they are, like she's say Minnesota. You know, people acknowledge that because that's like much more powerful than us little people cruising around here for you know 60 years or so, right? Just kind of going off of that a little bit, a friend of mine who is part of uh, a Dakota language society, so he's helping to revitalize his language, um, and was on a panel that I was on, and someone asked the question, what's the most important conversation we can be having right now about water? And he said, learn Dakota. And I thought that that was really beautiful in that, you know, he connected it to climate change also and how the places where we live are changing um, because of climate change, but also because of all the things that people have done to the land and to the water. And when you lose the language, you lose really important wayfinding um, that we're going to need in the future that all of us are going to need. And I thought that was a really powerful uh, note about language and, and that maps can tell us that map that you showed can tell us what Enbridge desires <laughs> for, for the future of this place, but it doesn't actually tell us anything about how we're going to survive um, together. I totally agree with all of this. I was also born in 1978, or 79, excuse me, and in 1978 it was made legal for Native people to practice our ceremonies, so I grew up incredibly privileged with that access. Um, to ceremony and to, to a relationship that has been lost. And I'm also, you know, mixed heritage. And so I also, I recognize that I have one foot on the shoulders of giants and another on a pile of bones. Um, and I see from there. I can see across great distances from there. And that's true for all of us. And it reminds me that we've never done anything alone, ever. Um, and then here we are. In a, you know, in a in a clay world, in an industry, in a 21st century, um, where we are hyper aware of what a map is, um, how uh, you know the seas are rising, um, so all of that is in question. You know, um, these boundaries, these lines, we have border issues, and I, I think of all of this as a shared trauma that we have with our with the dominant culture of the United States and and moreover a, a deep sadness that was developed when when this population chose to be white rather than where they're from i think something i think something happened in that relationship um, that is traumatic and i think we all suffer that trauma together you know um, I think it would be really important for us to recognize our belonging to place. Because when we look at those maps, we look at the brutality of being ascended from way above, you know? Putting yourself on a, on a, on a much higher level than your relationship to everything else. And, and I think we suffer from that dramatically. And so I charge you all with the responsibility because you put your hands in the dirt. Because, because of the craft you chose to work, you also created a relationship with the earth. You never made anything alone. Um, you work with our, one of our oldest mothers um, and our first medicine and understand that relationship that it's not singular, um, that there's a plurality in that and a relationship and a, and, a, and a devotion to the land, you all understand, clay will stop you from doing something that you want. You have to develop this relationship. You have to understand um, and, and bend to its will as it molds to yours. Um, but I think it's a much broader conversation than that. And really the whole interest why I, I was interested in coming here is because I think it's important to recognize that belonging um, and that relationship to the, to the land itself. And you might be a great conduit and, and a pile of seeds wedged into the clay of our society that can like sustain and remind people um, that renaming, it's, it's not by accident, you know? Like the, the, the 60 year old man who got a mountain named after him is, is moreover because the dominant culture of the United States forgot where they belong to 
And so they co-opt this land and rename it so that they have a deeper relationship to place, a long time relationship to place. And this is how rivers and, and everything gets uh, reused. And even states named after our languages is also a, a settler colonial movement towards innocence. It's a, it's a co-opting of that language to feel as though you belong to the place a lot more. Um, and I see that, I recognize that, but I think we can go deeper than that. Like you just got a lesson on what those words mean rather than the word itself that you've been saying forever. Um, understand that relationship and, and how can we transcribe the languages that existed here, because there are many different languages. This is a huge continent, um, and there are so many different cultures, and we have to recognize the, the relationship of the people to these lands, as well as the animals and the plants and everything that else belongs together in that matrix. And that's hard to see on that map, but it's also a really honest description of what's on that map. Um, especially when we start using satellites to look down. You can't find yourself in that, in that look, you know? We're, we're a part of all of that. As the 58-year-old white guy sitting up here, I have to say that I'm ready for you or you to take over because we've made a mess of it. We've made a mess of, of, of our country. We've made a mess of our planet. And it's time to give this to somebody who is more empathetic and more thoughtful. Um, it's interesting, as I think of maps, I can't help but to think that my son will never have a map in his hand. And, That's so true. That's so true. and I think that we, because of this, and because of the way we travel, and because of the way we, we, um, we move across our country, there are some that that do get in a car and as they drive across the country they see all the empty space and they think well there's nothing wrong here the world is fine look at all this green grass look at all these trees and and then there are those who travel by airplane by plane which is happening more and more frequently and they're not even seeing that but they're they're not concerned about that um, I'm not concerned about that when I'm flying in a plane I can't say that I'm any different than than they are but I think because of these technologies, I think that we're, we're even getting further and further away from, from the land that is, is what gives us um, our sustenance. Um, I, when I taught, when I taught uh, environmental science in high school, we used to talk about economy. And, and one of the questions that I had my students think about is, well, okay, so um, at what point, at what point um, will water become more, more expensive than gasoline. And they used to shake their head, it'll never happen. Well, it has, it has happened. Um, we used to talk about how um, the, 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 econ the, the economy of our country and, and how we wouldn't want to or couldn't hurt the economy of our country by, by becoming more sustainable. But at the end of the day, if there's no oxygen to breathe, the economy doesn't really matter. I was hoping we might turn the conversation at this point to a topic that's maybe a little bit challenging, but I think a conversation that this community would really like to have. And so the topic is something like, as a ceramic artist, uh, listening to all of these very urgent issues uh, and what's going on in the world, you can ask yourself a couple of different questions. Oh, one is, how can I incorporate more of a social practice dimension into my work? The other question that you can ask that I know some of you have, have written on is, what is my role as an artist in my community? And those are not exactly the same question. I, I wonder if you had some thoughts about which question comes first or how you think about the two together. What's community? <laughs> I mean, because there's this community, you know, there's the application of this on a, on a much global, you know, reach. And then there is the, community that I'm from, that born from, responsibilities that I have to family and, 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 uh, and ancestors and the landscape itself. And then there is the town I live in. Um, and then there is the two acres of land that I have, you know, responsible for, and then my family, you know. So I think 
it's interesting when we when we start thinking about that and we and we and we ask ourselves what that actually means, you know. Um, and then how do you engage at, at, at those different levels, you know? How I engage with my kids is not how I will engage with you, you know? Because um, uh, you're all too heavy. And <laughs> um, but but I, I do think that there is something, and I think it's something that we, we a couple of the projects that I'm, I've been doing lately have been towards this, this idea of how do you turn theory into practice and how do you, um, this direct directly to what Winona mentioned about not knowing how to make anything. Um, we have YouTube. You can you can DIY just about anything, but you also have an external hard drive for all of that knowledge. And so there's no drive to to actually learn it. You're like, oh, I'll just I'll just do a tutorial and you know limp on through. But there's no commitment to actually making it your own creating muscle memory around those sorts of projects. And, um, and because of that, yeah, all of our manufacturing, all of the development, it wasn't that long ago, we used to make everything in our house. Like I remember growing up and having shirts and shoes made for me, you know? Um, and that wasn't bizarre, you know? That was normal. Um, and, and, you know, since what, the 1950s, where we developed planned and perceived obsolescence, like, it hasn't been that long. For most of human experience, we've done a pretty decent job as far as understanding the weight and the wake of our existence. Um, and we took care of each other in, in that practice. But, you know, 2019, you go to any urban center and you can get an artisanal sandwich you know, um, which is proof that the only thing somebody learned how to make was a sandwich, and they killed it because that's what we do as a as a as a species. Um, they committed to that and made it beautiful, artisanal. You know, um, and and seeing that reinforces this idea in my head. So I'm 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 interested in how do we develop projects that allow the use of that larger international global community. Um, develop projects that create prompts for people to participate. I recognize the power of social media as a, as a tool for activism, and it is one of the laziest tools for activism. There's no action, there's no activeness in the activism, but it has tremendous reach and tremendous power as far as showing people. But I think that there's something in allowing people to not get a gold star and a, and a endorphin rush for liking and sharing, but give them a project, give them a prompt, something simple, something, something that doesn't necessarily look like craft, but allows people to actually embed their activism with their muscles. Um, and those sorts of prompts, I think, allows people to engage with material and start to understand what it means to make something um, on a much broader level. Uh, we're all skilled. We all have craftsmanship, but the majority of our, of our community does not. So uh, rather than shame them, you know, uh, give them an opportunity to try. And, and you will see that in their failure, the value of your week work will increase, you know. Um, and, and then some of them will get hooked, and, and they will learn how to do something. Um, I, I have projects that I try to do that sort of thing. It's like, it's like fluxist kind of art, but with meaning, you know? If, you, if, if fluxist could have meaning, that's, I think, an avenue that we can utilize all the technology we have now and redevelop our, our ability to make things with, you know, our thumb and our commitment to a, a big brain, you know? I think a lot about what you were saying about relationships and how we can um, get beyond talking about things and really build those deeper relationships and that includes with the people around us um, that share the place that we live and the time that we live in um, and so one of the projects that I'm um, working on right now and I gave Winona a pair of these <laughs> earrings this morning that she's wearing um, is that um, in northern Minnesota right now there is a proposal to open a new copper nickel mine um, by Polymet um, another one of these Canadian 
the companies. <laughs> that another bad idea. Um, and you know, one of the things that I found in spending a lot of time trying to build relationships with people in the communities that I know up north is that there are a lot of things we don't talk about, and some of that has to do with the histories of abuse. You know, our relationship with land as people who came to this country to work in industries like this um, have been very abusive. And what happens is that abuse comes home. So my grandfather who worked in the mines was also a very abusive person. Um, I also loved him and there were many good things that he taught us, but um, also uh, abused alcohol. This is an issue, abuse of drugs. And so we've become patterned in these ways of relating. Um, and so what we're doing as an art project to try to open up a space for these conversations and to remember and to start to repair those relationships is that we're using taconite pellets, which are a kind of pellet that is made from iron and clay. Um, as a way to efficiently create uh, steel from waste, what is you know low-grade ore. Um, we're creating taconite pellets out of wool. And so what we're doing is we're gathering wool from a farmer um, who lives in my community, a woman who's doing really great things on the land with regenerative agriculture, and then we're dyeing that wool with the red earth that would be used to make a taconite pellet. Um, and then we're felting it. So as a community process, we're getting in circles and we're getting our hands dirty, getting to know that red earth um, really intimately. And um, in the process of felting, you know, you sort of are haphazardly making an object. And people say, well, what is it for? <laughs> What's a wool taconite pellet for? <laughs> and then we get to ask that question um, and we get to answer. And one of the things that I found that a wool taconite pellet is good for <laughs> is um, provoking these exactly these kinds of conversations. And so while we're felting and our hands are all red, we're sharing stories with each other about what we remember from our childhoods. Um, and a lot of the women that are in these circles are remembering a lot of things about mining and the mining economy, an extraction-based economy um, that I think is going to be useful as they weigh decisions as a community about the future. Um, and so those are the kinds of things that I think a socially engaged practice that has material um, and those relationships with material at the heart of it. And then you can find ways to use social media um, to share those stories and to help other people see that, you know, these are simple things. I, I'm not a, a fiber artist, really, <laughs> um, but I can make a damn good wool taconite pellet. <laughs> For most of my, my art making um, career, I've been doing collaborative installation and, and so the small communities that I've built with those installations, um, it's, it's, it's a small community and, and the conversations that happen um, I, I think are pretty, have been pretty incredible for me and, and a learning experience for me and I hope a learning experience for my, for my collaborators. The, the last three pieces that I've made, projects that I've made, um, happened right after, or started right after um, the, or right about the time the election, the 2016 election, and and I, at one point in time, I was, I, I really didn't want to talk about politics anymore. I didn't, I didn't want to talk. I didn't, I didn't want to. I, I try really hard, first of all, not to, for my students, not to know where I stand politically, and and I think it's important with who I am and as a teacher and as a professor. Um, but, it, but one of my friends told me that I really couldn't do that anymore, that I, that I needed to at least try to make a difference in, in the way that they think. And so that's really where the, the last three projects were born. And, and what I do is I show up in a gallery with a, a couple of tons of clay and, and, and I get the, my collaborators, my artists, to start thinking about about what polarizes our country and what pulls us apart. And, and we paint these words on the wall. And then we start thinking about what are possibilities to, to bring us back together, to bring us together as a society and as a culture. And, and, and while I'm doing this, I talk a lot about, about listening to each other and, and not judging each other for the way that we think. And, and it's interesting because quite often, the word politics doesn't ever even come up in conversation. Um, and, and it makes me kind of proud of, of the people that I've worked with the last three, three times that I've made these, these objects. Um, but by the time some of these students that I work with are from different, um, I, I've always done them on college campuses and some of them are not artists. 
Um, but by the time they finish with this project, they have made things. Um, and, and it's pretty interesting if you think about, um, I don't know, making literally a couple hundred thousand marbles by hand, what kind of community that builds and, and the conversations that can happen during those, um, during those, those moments. <laughs> and so as, as I was talking earlier about active listening and it's somewhat difficult to sit up here and try to listen to what my panelists are saying um, as I'm trying to t think about what it is that I'm going to talk about next. And it's really difficult, but this is a, a, a huge important part of my practice and, and what I try to, uh, to instill in, in the people that I work with. One of the things I, I, I think I draw out of, the, of what we've just heard is, um, on the one hand, you know, being an artist doesn't always involve making works of art like things. At the same time, we certainly heard last night and then some more this morning about you can learn from things in a very interesting sort of way. I mean, those little clay balls of, uh, of seeds uh, or the magic jars uh, of the Ojibwe. And, and so really, there's kind of a whole ecosystem there, right? There are things, there are stories, and there are relationships. And somehow the activity of the artist is about really just facilitating the way that all those different things stitch together. It, and, but then somehow in the background of that, I know this is a topic that often comes up in Ensika, is how one tries to make a living as an artist. And, and so I'm curious if any of you have any thoughts to share about, say you're a young person setting out in the world and you want to be an artist. Does that necessarily imply anything about how you get your paycheck? Or is it really more of an orientation that you're going to have towards the people you know, the places that you live? Uh, and maybe you make your living some other way. I don't make any money making little clay balls. <laughs> Um, I, I, I try to tell my students who, who, who want to be this, who, who want to do this, that um, you, you have to be honest with yourself and honest with the work that you make, and if you can make money from it, then, then so be it. Um, I'm lucky. I'm, I'm a professor. I, I don't really have to, um, I don't have to make any money from the art that I make. Um, and so I, I have a really close friend who's, who does. That's who she is. She's an artist, and, and, and she tells me all the time, well, Steve, you're a professor. You don't have to worry about this. And it's true. It's true. And I think an awful lot of us as, as artists, we, um, well, especially us that are teachers, we, we don't really realize how lucky we are that we get to make the art that we make and, and profess and teach. Um, but, but I think, yeah, if you're going to make art, I, that, that to be honest with yourself, you can't really think about how you're going to make the money from it. I have incredibly low overhead. <laughs> <laughs> uh, honestly, like I, I, I went to undergrad at the Institute of American Indian Arts, and then I started making objects. Um, selling them in a gallery in Santa Fe, New Mexico, where I live now, um, and got exhausted with that whole uh, uh, scene and was making, making money uh, from doing it, but I was also reinforcing um, a narrative of, of uh, culture for sale, um, like Native American art within the, within the context of, a, of, of an economy. Um, was developed externally. There's no word for art in our language. You know, there's no word for artist um, in our language. Uh, these are all things that have kind of been imposed, and 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 you engage. I mean, we are an incredibly adaptable species. You know, um, and if there is any custom to native people, it's that adaptability. You know, um, and so there was an industry put on um, uh, called the Native American art industry. And in that industry, clay has a way higher material value than it does for the Western art uh, um, aesthetic. And, um, and so working with clay, uh, you know, there's something, there's something in that that's, that was interesting. I didn't go to grad school, um, and so I don't have debt. And I recognize that you know, debt is something, that's, an, that's the new reservation, you know? Um, uh, a friend of mine who lives here, actually, 
we were having this conversation. His name's uh, Rory, Rory Wake Him Up. Um, and Rory he said, debt's the new reservation, and you're all Indians now. Um, so with that being said, you also have access to people who've, know, who've learned how to get off of that space and, and slip through those, those perimeters and those boundaries um, right around you. But I got tired and exhausted of this idea of, of selling culture uh, um, for, for economic gains. Um, and this is like the second time that I've ever been to Inseca. I was here in, I believe it was 2014, the initial multicultural fellowship gathering. Yeah, it was appalling. <laughs> it was appalling. Um, and so I never came back. I never came back. And, and I didn't come back because within the industry of Native American art, there was, I was like literally going to, you know, going to panels, seeing people talk, pro profess about everything that they've accomplished. And then I would go to their gallery show and I was like, I get the same price point as this cat, you know? Um, and, and so I didn't have, I wasn't invested at all in what this brings to us as a community from an economic standpoint. Um, I come back, honestly, because of this panel and the opportunity to have this conversation. Um, how do you make money doing this? I think if that's your, what you're aiming for, then you're aiming in the wrong direction. Um, because it, it, money is insatiable. There is no, there is no amount that, <laughs> I've never sold anything that was justified for the amount of money that I got for it. I put way too much into everything I make and there's never a dollar amount that seems equal. Um, and no matter what that is. And so I think we, the reason why we do it is because making and working with clay makes me a better person. It makes me better, you know? Um, and there's no m m m monetary value that that, <laughs> that that, you know, I don't know who to pay to make me better. Um, and I can't afford a psychiatrist, you know? Um, and, you know, healthcare is, free for me and <laughs> terrible <laughs> and so if I don't go if you want to be successful like you have to you have to ask yourself what that means um, you know oftentimes people talk about aiming for the stars and that is stupid um, I honestly believe what you must do in order to have success in anything is aim low and put every Thing you got into it. Save nothing for the, for the return. Put everything you got into that one little, little achievable goal. And then aim again. You know, do it again and again. And the next thing you know, you, you have what you would consider success, you know. But you're not, you're not disappointed. You're, you, you spend your life being uh, proud of what you've accomplished rather than disappointed that you haven't gotten it. To the extent that money is an abstraction that allows us to have transactional relationships, I think it's bad. Um, to the extent that the things, the ways that we exchange our time and our care um, can build relationships, it's good. You know, we clearly need, my landlord doesn't accept um, wool taconite pellets yet. <laughs> so I do have to, <laughs> so I do have to make some money. Um, but I, I, I think a lot about the if informal economies that have sustained a lot of our communities. So thinking uh, you know, about the town that I come from, for example, um, nobody had much money when I was growing up. You know, we were all pretty poor. Um, and we uh, made it by because we would trade chopping firewood for childcare or plowing this driveway for, um, for another essential part of sustaining life. And I think that the people where I come from forget that. They forget that that's a way to live and that actually those things made us closer. And I think about how something like an oil pipeline comes along and a few people get a land payment and they get a lot less than um, Enbridge pays the lobbyists and, or pays the politicians. You know, they get a little bit of money for a little while. But what happens is they're now on, on the side of this way of thinking, right? And so anyone who goes against that 
is, a, is ultimately like you've severed that relationship. You've made something transactional. And so now I'm not going to plow your driveway. Um, I'm not going to watch your kids. I'm not going to give you what you need to survive here together because you don't agree with me about this oil pipeline. And that's what I see as being the downfall of thinking about the work we're doing as artists and as cultural organizers in these kind of monetary terms is that, you know, once you start to make things transactional, you're starting to divide yourself from the things and the processes and the people that actually we need to sustain life. Um, and I'm ready for an economy that doesn't do that. You know, I like this vision of an economy that is actually about doing things that make life better for people um, and also for other living things. You know, that we're not um, thinking that the job of land is to produce as much of one thing that we want, um, that we actually have to be making more relationships because an ecology that has lots of diverse relationships is a more resilient ecology. Um, and it's the same with our relationships in our community, so. I do come from a place where there's a pretty strong subsistence economy. And I do really think that's the way to go because, you know, and you look at them this worldwide scale and there's, you know, I'm an economist by training, so there's this like GNP, right? You know, gross national product and then there's like, then there's a whole other set of indicators looked in the world like the gross national happiness indexing. <laughs> Have you seen that? You know what I'm saying? It's like not everybody values, money doesn't actually make you happy. You know what I'm saying is you could have a lot of money as a country but not be a particularly happy country, that'd be us, right? But you get countries that don't have a lot of money but they're super happy and that's because their quality of life indicators are not tied to income, but they're tied to, like I was in Vanuatu, which is one of the happiest countries in the world, and those guys are all local, you know, but they're an island. I mean, first of all, they're a Melanesian island, so that's a pretty good start, right? You know, um, but aside from that, they're all local economy. And I think about that a lot because I think that the more that your life is based on how much money you have in it, the, the, it you're going to be stressed out most of the time. And, and so I think that we have this opportunity to reconfigure e economies so that you're less dependent on cash. You have more local energy. And if you have, don't have to pay for your, your electric bill or your heat bill because you got a solar thermal panel, that's less stress. That's money you don't have to take from Enbridge or some corporation, right? If you have local food, your little 10 by 20 garden spot or 10 by 10, that's about, you know, 800 bucks worth of food a year. Aggregate that up. You know what I'm saying is just start reducing and then, and then traditionally economies, you know, economy itself doesn't mean cash. That's not what that means. You know, it's about wealth and wealth is not cash. Wealth is, you know, I think of our community and uh, there was this one year and I think it was 18, 62, there's this reserve on Lake Superior called Keweena Bay, Keweena Bay Reservation, and they had 463,000 pounds of maple sugar. Did y'all hear that? 463,000 pounds of maple sugar. That's like sugar without slaves, too. I just want to point that out, right? I mean, that's wealth. You understand what I'm saying? Is if you have something like that, and so, like, I'm, it's maple syruping season here now. I'm trying to be a sugar mama. That's what we call it. I got a sugar bush there in the woods, but uh, you know, that's my point is, is, that, is that we can be part of making beautiful things that, um, and that's what we should just keep doing. And you know, sometimes you need some cash for that, but my goal is to reduce the amount of cash you have because um, that you're required to have in this society. Because that is the force that we don't control. But we do control how we eat, where our food comes from, you know, where our energy comes from, where our water comes from. And the more care you take of things that are in your territory, the more chance you have of being able to keep that agreement with those, those things in the future. Thanks so much. I, I think I want to gradually start transitioning into the part of the session where we open the floor to some questions for the audience. Um, if you have a question in mind for the panel, there are these two microphones that are uh, in the aisleways between the seating sections. So um, yeah, please line up at those microphones if you, if you have a question. I thought I would seed this part by actually uh, passing on a question that came up last night after the keynote address in a conversation I was having with some people, um, which was basically, uh, you know, if you're, if you're teaching art and want to have that teaching incorporate a, a social practice component or a community engagement component, but you're doing that with kids, 
right? So at the K through 12 level, several of you have already commented on little things that you pass on to your children or other kids that you know that sort of get them in the right frame of mind for all of this. And I just wonder if any of you had any particular thoughts or lessons to uh, experience to share about that. Uh, I mean, I mentioned the one about, you know, saying hello to the river is another, but I also really believe in listening to children and the questions that they ask and learning from them because uh, my kids I know ask questions that I think are probably flowing through a room of adults, but we've somehow learned or taught ourselves those aren't appropriate. And one example has to do with, t with talking about racism. And you know, we were talking about what Indigenous Peoples Day is here um, in Minneapolis, and my son said, uh, well, if Dakota people are the first people, who are we? And then he asked the question, what are white people? And these are the kinds of questions that like, you know, that doesn't, that question doesn't get asked that way at events like this or at conferences, but maybe it should because then we can have an honest conversation. So anyway, learn from the children too, yeah. Yeah, I would, I would totally agree with that. There's something in a child we don't give them enough credit. They are thinking creatures, you know, they're just like us and they don't have a full cup like we do, you know? <laughs> so their ability to navigate and actually formulate a question that is f profound compared to ourselves, you know, um, is, yeah, pay attention, pay attention to those spaces as well. Good morning. Um, I have a question in terms of how we make this paradigm shift within our culture. Um, I ha kind of have had a foot in both uh, going to a girls' Episcopal school and having a husband with a strong Jewish family background. And, uh, you know, not to offend anyone, but how do we overcome this sense that is deeply rooted in the Jewish and Christian faiths that man has dominion over nature and all things? I think is kind of a root, a, a root of this problem or a, a a really strong part, and how do we address that being respectful to people, but also to open up and realize that that is fundamentally the cancer that we have? I question that. I, I, I think right now, if we read the books and stuff like that, but I think that there's probably a much older, much deeper, you know, rooted conversation. A lot of those have been transcribed, and um, a lot of that, there's a lot of misinformation in that transcription. Um, that celebrates uh, humans and men, you know? Um, so like having that as a, as a primer, if, if what you say is do man has dominion over, like already there's a problem. Um, um, and so something got miscommunicated, you know, and it was probably a man who wrote that down or said that, um, most likely. Uh, so I think we can move towards that, that paradigm shift, but, and, and I think it's not a, a matter of like going back, but recognizing what is, what makes sense, you know? And, and when those contradictions come into play, having the, not being path dependent on, on something written. I and mean, this is the power of storytelling and oral cultures versus uh, written, written form and how rigid that becomes. Actually, I have a little anecdote to follow up there. I, you know, I think some of these ideas of that dominion get captured sort of, I don't know, more like in the 16th, 17th century in this picture of the great chain of being. And there are some great uh, images of the great chain of being that were drawn at that time where you note that you have kind of humans and the angels up at the top, but at the bottom are trees and rocks and fire. And if you've ever tried to wood fire clay, you know that trees and rocks and fire are not sitting way below you on, on the hierarchy of who gets to say what. So uh, I actually feel like traditional craft is a really good way to, to work against that kind of modern scientific picture of, of humanity's dominion over nature. Yeah. I'm coming from Canada, we're the bad guys, and uh, <laughs> we're trying to send pipes through your territory. Not all of us though, I gotta say that. I'm actively trying to work against that. And I keep finding out ways that I take for granted that I'm very evil and I'm not being facetious. Like this cup I made using clay from <clears throat> a dig we do every year on a place called Mount Nebo. Now, it's called a mountain, but it's on the prairie, so you can roll a ball down it in about two seconds. But uh, it was only when we started doing recognition of the treaty lands 
and being thankful and beginning, we're like, hey, we should be able to say this in the local language too. And then when we started studying uh, Soto and Ojibwe and Cree, we realized Nibo meant uh, death. And we went to the top and sure enough, there's little houses there, lying down houses, and this is a graveyard. And we're like, oh crap, we've been stealing land from a graveyard. We are, you know, we should all have wide mustaches that are curled up and snicker by train tracks all the time. We were not aware of that at all until we began to learn language. Are there any places where, um, and maybe this is a question for everybody here, are there places where potters and local indigenous people can get together and learn from each other? We kind of did it by accident and it was kind of temporary, but are there any ongoing projects like that? I don't know of, I don't know of any. Um, to that, to that question, uh, but I'm not, I'm just one person, you know? Um, and I go and dig my clay at a clay supply store. So um, <laughs> I live in the Southwest and, <laughs> uh, I live in the Southwest and, um, and started working with clay in, in New Mexico and my introduction to clay, um, I'm from clay people but our, our uh, relationship to clay and the development of, of, of clay objects and stuff has been lost for uh, probably about three generations now. So I didn't have anybody to learn from. Um, I've dug clay in my community and I bring back little buckets of it and wedge it into my, my resourced bot clay um, for like no reason at all other than I feel like there's a relationship to place, you know? Um, particularly being in the Southwest, you know, and there's a rich culture of ceramics there that um, I have, I don't get to have any, I, there's no lateral violence that I create in my making where I'm co-opting any of that visual language or anything. And their clay spots are like maintained sacred and secret, you know. Um, I have no right even as a native person to be like, hey, you know, can we have this exchange, you know? Um, I need to, and, and just so I know, you know? And I think that's, you know, as we have these sorts of conversations, I think it's, I think it's important to remind everybody, I think there is an opportunity for that sort of exchange. Um, but I think, as I'm working with more and more institutions and museums and stuff like that, there's always an effort to make us visible. Um, and, just because you can't see it doesn't mean it's invisible, you know? Some of those things are maintained because it's important that they maintain it, you know? So, um, yeah, because sometimes the clay is where a bunch of people died, you know? <laughs> like, uh, yeah, I don't know. I don't know of any myself. And I, I also don't have a direct answer to that question, but um, I am part of an organization here in the Twin Cities called the Healing Place Collaborative, which was started by a Dakota artist named Mona Smith. And her vision for that organization was to bring together indigenous people uh, with other artists and makers who are doing work around the Mississippi River and the confluence here, which is the Badote uh, to Dakota people. And that process is a slow process of building relationships together over many years. It's been four years since I've been participating in Healing Place Collaborative Gatherings, and it has had a profound effect on my sense of who I am and where I am, especially. Um, and so I think those are the kinds of things that you could be part of creating something like that wherever you are. I mean, there are indigenous people everywhere, um, and you should um, you know, that could be a really good process. And there's some scholarly articles that have been written about Healing Place that you can find that kind of talk about the process. But it really is based on this really basic thing of visiting and building relationships and then also um, when we can, going out into the land and hearing stories. Um, and then a lot of inner work, right? Because mm -hmm. there's a lot of trauma that needs to be healed on all of our parts. I mean, I'm, you recognize this early on that, you know, we're all suffering from the trauma of this system and this uh, colonial culture um, in different ways. And so I, I would echo that in, like Winona said last night, control your destiny. Go find, go find um, some people to work with. There, I'm sure, are people that you might not even realize in your neighborhood, in your town, in your city that um, would be happy to to uh, do something like this. So my name's Chris Corson. 
Um, I'm a figurative sculptor. My personal background is in the labor movement, uh, so issues of social justice, justice at work, uh, themes of inequality have always been very important to me, and they come out now in the figures that I do. Um, I live outside of Washington, D.C., which is you know, one of the hotbeds of all the politicians and, and the policymakers who are responsible for all the mischief that we're talking about. And I'm getting to the point now. Um, the Cato Institute, which is about as right-wing as you can get, libertarian think tank, decided to have an art exhibition on the theme of everyone's rhetoric is so heated and people don't talk to one another, and so why don't we have an art exhibition as a springboard for discussion? Now, as I say, I don't agree with Cato on anything else, but at least I do agree about that. And I applied and I got in, and so now I'm in the position of being, I will be part of at least a couple of presentations on this topic. And last night has been very helpful to me, this panel discussion this morning, it's wonderful. Because otherwise, I really wasn't sure what I would say. But if you had the opportunity, and frankly, I'd rather send you into Cato than me, um, but if you had the opportunity to walk into Cato and say something about art and, and being able to talk to one another, um, please put some words into my mouth, you know, help me out. No. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I don't. I, I don't. I don't know what to. I, I think that's great. I think it's great that there's there's a there's a a, a, a right organization, right? Cato. I'm not even Very. familiar with it. Very. Okay. So Cato is having an art exhibition to create a um, a dialogue because it's so heated right now, a political dialogue. So art is a conduit for that. Um, this gentleman is going to be in that exhibition and wanted to know if there was, if we had the opportunity that he's having, what kind of language could we, is there anything we could put in his mouth? Um, I, I vote with my dollar, um, <laughs> like every day. So I don't know. Um, I don't know what to say. Yeah, I, I was going to say, um, you know, I don't know if they can put that slide up. You know that piece I showed you last night, Not Afraid to Look? That's a really interesting kind of, it has this like epic history, right? And then it's in the middle of a social movement. And so, I mean, I do, I do know that art changes how you look at the world. You know, and so I think like kind of like thought provoking in that context and how, you know, those moments, I mean, you know, I've seen, I seen a lot of great art at the edge of some project that never happened. You know, and I'm like, that's the way you do it. Put your like magical art right up there. You know, and it, it'll help. And so, uh, I, uh, you know, I, oh, there it is, that one, right? Mm -hmm. Like, that's like epic piece, right? We're trying to put that in, in Duluth. I just want to let you know I'm, I'm working on raising a little money to bring his, his brother, his twin, uh, to Duluth to look over Superior, mm -hmm. you know, to look over the lake. You know, because, I don't, you know, it's the same thing as, like, it's, you know, a, a town that has a lot of mining and oil interests in it, and I'm like, you know, how do I put my little, little like, let's think about this wedge in there. And, you know, you could be sure that it's, it's, there's a lot of discussion about a lot of those things there, as opposed to the Cato Institute. But still, like, the idea of doing an art installation is, you know, is a really important way to have some kind of a dialogue. And so like, that's our project is trying to, is it, we intend to bring this guy to Duluth, and then it'll be a really interesting conversation, you know, so. Because I was rude, I wanted to. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, <laughs> courage, you know what I'm saying? Like this is this is the benefit of an artist, and why we get access and and to these places. We have incredible privilege because we're viewed as both geniuses and maniacs simultaneously. <laughs> you know, so if you get a seat at the table. See if you can pull the tablecloth out, you know? 
don't don't go in there appreciative and and grateful for the opportunity. Go in there with courage, you know, and and challenge that space. I think about social practice as an ambiguity dependent on the interpretation of the artist that's engaged in it, and I want to know what social practice means to each of you. For me, for me, it just means making a difference, making a change, making a change one, one person at a time. I don't really like very much defining art terminology. Only, I mean, I don't come from a formal artistic background, and so I first encountered the term social practice when somebody who had been through a MFA program was like, what you're doing is social practice. And I'm like, oh great, that I'm still just doing what I'm doing. Um, but I do think a lot about relationships and about the social nature of human beings and also how culture shifts. And you know, and there were questions a little bit earlier about how we shift a culture that is so set in this way. Um, and I really believe that culture and social space and relationships are what is upstream of the policies and the behaviors that are, gonna sh that are shaping our world. And so um, as artists, whether we call ourselves social practice artists or whether we're working with material in a really intentional way, we are shaping the culture that we are a part of. And there's a way that we can do that passively, and then there's a way that we can be really active and conscious in doing that, and I believe in the conscious way, you know, that we can have a big effect if we really think intentionally about the relationships we're making, all of those relationships. And so that's, that's what social practice is to me, but. Yeah, I think, it's, I think it's a much older, much older conversation that's getting like a lot of play through institutions right now and, and exposure, like this notion of social practice. And it's like, that's how we've existed for tens of thousands of years, you know? Um, sewing circles and all of these sorts of things are embedded in, in a social practice. Um, right now, I'm really interested in it as like a form of engineering, you know? How do you build bridges from one culture, community to another, you, you know, that there can be something that exists in that space. Um, but yeah, I think it's really old. And I think as we define it, we actually limit what it is. I'm interested in a conversation surrounding sustainability within the ceramics world. Um, I find it a little bit conflicting, the amount that we take from the earth in this art practice. Um, and yeah, I guess I'm just interested in people's thoughts on that. And like firing practices and the amount of energy that's used in, in a long fire and things like that. Okay, and the next question there. I guess I was, uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about the maps the, the, as lenses um, on how we view society um, and how they're ever changing. Um, I took a road trip down to Baja, Mexico. My GPS led me down an old road. Um, there's all kinds of old trails. Um, there's different maps. There's political maps. There's maps with loot for the taking that are sketched out. You know, there's a map that showed political weakness from a, a nation of people that could be taken over by the Enbridge pipeline. Um, so I guess it's that idea of maps are, you know, and the names that are on maps, again, it's a, it's a blink of an eye. Um, and I guess that's, you know, that's one, one thing that I wanted to talk about. The second thing is just quickly, coming from upstate New York, you know, we come from the land of the first takesy baxy um, We gave a huge reservation to our people, to our native peoples, and we're the first people that, that, that said, well, actually, we're gonna take that back. Um, we have a land that's super native. They were driven out during um, the Revolutionary War and up to Canada. And so most of our, I mean, one of our, I think the original reservation is now Turning Stone Casino in upstate New York. And uh, the Adirondacks is where they used to be. Um, so I think it's going off of that first question, which is how do we bring our natives back? Um, they're all the way across the border in another country. Um, it's very hard to get access to them. Um, when I'm here in Minnesota, it feels great um, that we have natives that are around us. You can see a native on a street. Um, in upstate New York, there are no natives, you know, um, that you'll see on a regular basis. If they are, they're hidden. Um, so it's more of how can we, the seed ball is, is extremely important. You know, how do we get those traditions and cultures back? 
you know, how do we open that conversation? Thanks, and then maybe just one last one on that side. Well, my last one is two, the seed ball. Winona, I, how old was that seed ball? And the second question is uh, just that I remember my Lord said to me, take care of this garden. So dominion, not dominion, but husbandry. Well, forget those male associations with husbandry. That's not the case. You know, it's a funny conversation about that seed. They said it was 800 years old, that those, those old squash seeds, you know, and then someone, then there was like all this study and they said, you know, and there was like this big hoopla ball or whatever, and then finally someone said, well, that's not actually true. It's a Miami seed and it's older. <laughs> I mean, there was like a lot of, you know, so anyway, my point is, is that that was, that's old. And I was reading today in the, in the, that, uh, that doomsday vault for seeds isn't doing good. Did you see that? Yeah, I, was, I mean, not to say because I you know, want everything to work out, but you know, with permafrost has, has melted. <laughs> and they, they had to put it like as these structural engineering changes in to keep the world's seeds better. I was like, stick to the clay ball. <laughs> you know, I mean, seeds should be in communities. You know, they should be other places too, but they should be in communities because seeds need to be loved to take care of, you know, to bring back, you know. And kind of this other, this other brother here I was thinking about, we use the word rematriation. It's not repatriation, it's rematriation. It's the recovery of seeds, the recovery of, of, you know, maybe it's things like that they took your drums or like, you know, anthropologists have, and it's a recovery of people too. You know, bringing, bringing things back to territories. You know, and I, and I like that concept because also within rematriation is, is this reaffirmation of, of the feminine. You know, and so I, I look at that kind of bigger picture and it's happening a lot of places. You know, it's happening everywhere. You know, so that's just a little bit. Great. Well, uh, let me just say once again, there's room L100H for people who want to keep talking about these issues. And let's thank our wonderful panelists again. Mm -hmm.